And <clears throat> we've been talking about living a transformed life. <clears throat> Not being squeezed into the mold of the culture in which we live. Why? Because there are some uh, authors in the scriptures who say that this culture was designed by the prince of the power of the air. And it's designed to keep you from living the abundant and happy life. And so to the extent that we are transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ is the extent to which we get to enjoy the life that Christ has offered. Now, <clears throat> this morning our theme has been all uh, through the uh, topic on being transformed is Paul's writing, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, <clears throat> but let God transform you into a new person. Yeah, by changing the way you think. Now, in the uh, uh, NIV, it says by renewing your mind. In the uh, 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 New Living, it says by changing the way that you think. Now, here's the thing about it. God is more interested in the way that you think than in your circumstances. Now, <clears throat> we're focused on the circumstances. Take away this bad thing. Change this, change that. Change my circumstances. However, God is interested in how we think way more than he's interested in the circumstances. In fact, he will use circumstances to work with us on how we do think. Now, why should we change our mind? Because nothing's going to happen. No transformation, nothing until we change the way that we think. <clears throat> the premise is that God has given to us a powerful creative mind. We're made in his image. And we tend to bring about what is in our thought life. If you're thinking about eating a chocolate cupcake with chocolate icing on it, it won't be long until you are. <laughs> Thoughts precede desire and intent and action. Now, <clears throat> why do we need to change the way we think? Because the way we think, our thoughts control our life. Your thoughts control your life. And uh, in Proverbs, written by Solomon, a uh, wise guy, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Because oh, I was just thinking it. It's harm no, your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, just to uh, sort of bring to mind how important is this whole concept, let's say that we were running our thoughts all the time up on a screen where everyone could see. Uh, <coughs> what in the world would be up there? Some people would be negative, critical, angry. Uh, some people would be running lust thoughts. Some people would be running... Uh, <clears throat> just nasty, mean thoughts. Some people would be running a whole bunch of things. Now, the problem with that is, Proverbs says, Solomon says, those thoughts, your thought life, is shaping your real life. Ugh, that's what's shaping my life? Now, <clears throat> in order to experience the full life that God has for us, we need to think differently transformed thinking and uh, <coughs> some of us are thinking thoughts that aren't true when we were younger we were told you're dumb you'll never amount to anything uh, you're ugly you're fat you're skinny you're everything and we still it doesn't have to be true if we think it it shows up in how we act and so some of us are thinking things that aren't true. Remember, uh, Teresa was talking about labels that we stick on us that carry through life. Whether they're true or not, they affect how we act. Your thoughts shape your life. So the first reason we have to deal with our thought life is because it shapes our real life, our outside life. The second reason is because <coughs> sin in your mind your, is the battleground where sin is eventually expressed. That's where I win and lose the battle is smack between my ears. Now, if you learn how to manage your mind, you will learn how to manage your life. So, uh, Paul is saying in this uh, scripture where we, uh, a little uh, earlier, he says, I love to do God's will, 
But as far as my new nature is concerned, I love to do God's will. As far as when I came to Christ, he gave me a new nature. That new nature wants to do what God wants me to do. Then he's got a big butt. A few months ago, we talked about we have big butts. There's something else, but there's something else deep in me that's at war with my mind. The war for the mind, the battle for the mind. And it wins. <laughs> and it makes me a slave to sin. And I want to be God's servant, but instead I'm enslaved to sin. Why? <clears throat> There's a force that's causing him to think. But notice the war, fight, slave, enslaved. It's an intense battle. And I think one of the reasons we can get mentally exhausted is just this thing that's going on 24 hours a day. There's a lot of people who would like to control your mind. <laughs> the prince of the power of this air, who's designed a system to rob you of the full life, would like you to think a certain way. The culture that he designed would like you to think a certain way. Uh, it has to have you to consume in order for that culture to continue to exist. So when God is saying, be at peace, culture is saying, be discontented. Uh, always reach, always search. And so that culture wants you to think a certain way. The prince of the power of the air wants you to think a certain way. And here Paul is saying, my new nature is in conflict with my old nature. There's a sin principle in there which is causing me to think. So the second reason uh, is because uh, it's the battleground. It all takes place up there. So the first reason, your thought life controls your outer life. The second reason is the battleground for sin is in your thought life. And the third reason is you have to mind your thought life in order to experience peace. Now, <laughs> when we apply these principles, and this principle in particular, you will see a dramatic change in your life <laughs> as far as your ability to live at peace. An unmanaged mind tends to lead to tension, but a managed mind will give to you inner tranquility. A managed mind gives pressure, <laughs> gives peace. An unmanaged mind gives you pressure. An unmanaged mind gives you conflict and chaos. And a managed mind just gives you confidence. So <clears throat> a managed mind will give you strength, security, and serenity. Strength, security, and serenity. Why do I say that? Well, Paul is still dealing with this topic, but he says... If your sinful nature controls your mind, there is death. What's death? Eh, it's about the opposite of living, I think. So <laughs> you're not living. If your uh, uh, sinful nature, that nature Paul's saying, that conflict, if that's controlling your life, you're not living. <clears throat> but if the Holy Spirit controls your mind, there is life and peace. I'm wondering if part of the conflict comes from the turmoil about who's going to be boss, but part of the turmoil comes because we are allowing our former nature to make a lot of our decisions. Now, I think the temptation is to say, I can't change the way I think. It just, it, it just is. It, it just thinks. And uh, I would say that both culture and the prince of the power of the air would like you to think that, that your thought life has a life of its own. But there are some important things that God teaches us through the people who wrote uh, for him uh, over thousands of years. The authors have put together God's thoughts so that we can shape our thoughts. And so when we look in here, all of those teachings put together, it's kind of like an owner's manual. And so he says, no, you can control your thoughts. As a matter of fact... You're the only one who can control your thoughts. God may uh, want to, but he won't. He won't force himself on you. Satan may want to, but he can't. He can make a lot of suggestions. But in the end, we are the ones who control our mind. How do we bring that about when it feels like our thinking is so out of control? Now, <laughs> whether we're thinking guilty thoughts, bad thoughts, we say, God, Change my thinking, change my mind. And God will say, no, it's your mind. You change it yourself. And then he shows us why that is not impossible. Your thoughts, according to the owner's manual, are highly controllable. But there are three choices <coughs> we have to make as we look at this uh, compilation of writings, as we look at this owner's manual here. You have to feed your mind. You have to free your mind. 
and you have to focus your mind. You have to free it, feed it, free it, and focus it. And those three things will allow you to control your thinking. What do I mean by feed it? Well, you know, I've heard, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I've heard if you eat junk food and sugars and fats, it's bad for your body and it harms it. And uh, you wind up not feeling good or not having enough energy. The same is true of your mind. If you feed it stuff that is unhealthy, it does not operate properly, but it becomes anemic and weak, and it will, in fact, dominate you instead of you dominating your own thought life. So you have to feed it good information. There's a group in, uh, in Oxford in England, uh, and they send out the Oxford Analytica report and it's a group of professors who gather at 5.30 every morning and they get information from all over the world that happened in the last 24 hours <coughs> and they analyze it and uh, want to make a statement about what happened in the last 24 hours and so once they process it they, figure, they ask the question who's the best person in the world to make a statement about where we are today and so then they send an email off to that person and by 11 o'clock that morning uh, they have put together the Analytica, Oxford Analytica report. And it is bought by the US, the CIA buys it, large corporations buy it, the Soviet Union buys it, China buys it. Uh, <coughs> the top decision makers in the world do this. Why? It's based on the premise that the best decision makers need the best information to make the best decisions. Now, you and I may not be Oxford Analytica, but we have to have good the best information to make the best decisions. And if we do not have the best information, we cannot make good decisions. Now, Jesus addressed that a little bit in a, in a sideways way uh, when Satan was tempting him to make bread and feed himself. There's nothing wrong with that. He did it later to feed others, but it was not under the guidance of God. In other words, doing the right thing for the wrong reasons is not necessarily the right thing. So here, he said to make bread, and he quotes back, and he says, people need more than bread. You need butter, peanut butter, and jam. <laughs> oh no, wrong translation. <sighs> people need more than bread for their life. They must feed on every word of God. All of the authors who put this together, uh, <clears throat> Jesus is saying, you have to ingest this so that you can have life. And uh, when should I do it? I think you should do it morning, noon, and night. They say that the best way to eat is to graze. In other words, to eat small amounts all day rather than sitting down eating a huge meal, waiting a few hours and eating another huge meal. And it's a lot like that for your mind, which controls your actions and your uh, uh, eventual, how you live out your life. We need to continually read God's word, take it with us through the day, think about it. And uh, David was so into this. Remember last week we said that he was anointed to be king, and he was anointed years before he became king. And King Saul was the king at that time. That's why they called him King Saul. And so <clears throat> he tried to kill David, and David spent years hiding in caves going into strange countries, trying to keep himself alive as Paul chased him all through the uh, country, trying to take his life. How did David handle that stress? This, this gives some uh, meaning to Psalm uh, 119. And in verse 95, David writes, When wicked people hide to ambush and kill me, I quietly keep my mind on your decrees. We've had a stressful week, but you know, it's been weeks since anybody's tried to kill me. Really, it has. <laughs> but when your stress rises, David says, think about the word. And then he says, in the morning I rise up to think about your word. Uh, all day long I think about it. And then he says, when I'm laying in my bed in the watches of the night, I think about your word. That word has to saturate our being. Now, <laughs> why is it so hard to change that thinking. In other words, sometimes I, we think it's impossible to change our thinking. My thought life just has its own energy, takes over, thinks what it will, and I have this brain that's out of control. Why is that so hard 
to take control of our brain rather than it having its own life. The first, there's three enemies. One is your old nature. You thought the old way for years and years and years. Christ comes in and now you have that nature and the life you used to live plus the new life of Jesus Christ. And there's a bit of a struggle going on there. Paul says, I see in my body a principle at war. That's the battle for your brain. The principle at war. The battle for your brain. With the law of my mind taking me captive to the law of sin that dwells inside of me. In other words, there's an inner force that's taking us back to bad habits, wrong way of thinking. And uh, those who are, it goes on, those who are dominated by that sinful nature, they will think about sinful things. Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Now, where is all of this happening? It's not out there somewhere. It's right square between your ears. This whole battle for outcomes is happening between your ears. Now, <laughs> the second reason it's hard is because the another enemy is Satan, or uh, who, who Jesus called the prince of the power of the air, the one he kicked out a few eons ago, and uh, he's awful upset about that. He never got over it. He kind of holds a grudge. And uh, since God is such a powerful force, he can't do anything about it. But since you are God's kids... He can do stuff to you. And so he doesn't want you to think like God because that leads to peace and that leads to abundant living and that leads to the rich life. And he hates, he doesn't like you. <laughs> if you think everybody likes you, they don't, he doesn't. <laughs> and he wants you to do everything but enjoy life. And so he tries to keep you from thinking the way that God wants you to think, simply so you cannot enjoy life. Now, <laughs> that doesn't have to be, because greater is he who lives in you than he that is in the world. You have the power of God inside of you, and there is no power that can overcome that. You do not have to yield to Satan's suggestions, to the prince of the power of the air. Now, he can't take control of your thoughts, and God won't, he has allowed you free will, but he will make a lot of suggestions. Martin Luther said, you can't keep birds from flying over your head. You can't keep thoughts from going through your brain, but you can stop them from building a nest in your hair. And uh, when you guys get into small group, uh, and uh, we're you look at some of the applications of this this week, but... Uh, Rick Warren, who, who is on the, the tape there, I don't know whether he'll say this, he probably wouldn't, he's so nice, but I'm not. So he would say, and he does say uh, in his book, he says, you can't stop birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from pooping on you. <laughs> you, you don't have to put up with the stuff that goes through your mind, and not all of it's true. So here, Satan can't take scroll over your thought, but he can keep giving you suggestions. And he talks about strategies that Satan used. You find that you're getting tempted the same way over and over again. Like, you, 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 know, you, you know, I've been here. I've been in this exact spot. I've, I've had to struggle with this before, and here I am again. What is that? That's because Satan uses standard strategies that he tries to get us to think in a wrong way. To think in a wrong way. And he used them, one of the things that he uses uh, is unforgiveness. And Paul is writing this to the church in Corinthians, in Corinth. And he says, if forgive so that Satan won't outsmart you. He says, I've forgiven that person so that Satan won't outsmart me. Satan wants you to be resentful. He wants you to hold grudges. And he wants you to be angry. Why? Because it destroys your spirit. And his job is to make sure your spirit doesn't thrive. So he is always messing with you and getting you to think thoughts that destroy you rather than bless you. Okay, so your nature, Satan, the third enemy, is the value system designed by the prince of the power of the air, which is the culture, and we've talked about that quite a bit. Uh, all that is in this world, in this culture, the lust of flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but from this world. Now, how, we think the battle is unwinnable. We have so many thoughts that are so fast and so inappropriate at times and so counter to the mind of God. How can we win the battle? 
for our mind. Everybody wants you to think a certain way. We talked about this. The red carpet lease came out of Ford because they needed you to buy a car every two years so they could afford the contract they had just settled. Nothing wrong with the contract, but in order for them to do that, they had to get you to buy a car every two years. So they came out with what was called the red carpet lease. <coughs> they need you to think in a certain way. They need you to think that you need a new car every two years. In spite of the fact they'll go 200,000 miles. They need you to buy one every two years. Everybody wants you to think in a certain way. Don't be conformed. Be transformed. Though we, and how do we do it? Though we live in a world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. This is Paul again. He's still speaking to the Corinthian church. Our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, if you, in your bulletin there is that verse. And uh, if you underline strongholds, what is a stronghold? We're going to come back in a minute. Our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish any argument and every pretension. What's an argument and pretension? That's what we do in our mind to justify our actions. Oh, it's, 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 it's nothing really wrong with this. And so we argue within ourselves to justify our actions. Well, this weapon that you and I have within us demolishes those arguments. Suddenly, they carry no power and no weight. The weapon that we have crushes those wrong presuppositions against the knowledge of God. It, anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive for what's going on between our ears. And we make it obedient to Christ. Let's go back to that stronghold. A stronghold is a lie that we believe. In other words, this is not really bad. It's not that bad. Everybody's doing it. That, that's a stronghold, a lie that we believe. Some of them could be those labels we talked about. I believe I'm dumb, or I believe I'm ugly, or I believe I'll never... It's a stronghold that has to be crushed. God says through the spirit and the power of spiritual force that he has given to us and placed in us, we can demolish any wrong thinking that exists and take that captive uh, to the thought value of Jesus Christ. Any value system that we hold that is wrong is a stronghold. Any thought uh, system that we use that is not uh, of God is a stronghold that keeps us from being free to enjoy the life that God wants. So we have the stronghold which holds us captive, a way of thinking which will hold us captive. In the case of unforgiveness, which will destroy you, we have something that is destroying us but Jesus Christ said, no, there's an answer. He said, I'm the truth, and the truth will set you free. You have to free your mind from those strongholds. And he gave you the spirit to crush those strongholds. The Greek word for tape captive is you take a country captive. You dominate it, you control it, and you take it captive. That thought life has to be taken captive and made obedient to God or put into submission. Now, when we look at, we said that uh, sin and temptation happens between our ears. We tend to think temptation is out there. I came across something. I was uh, <coughs> working with a, a friend of mine who was uh, addicted, and uh, his story was always the same. <laughs> I never had any intentions of doing anything. Then I ran into an old friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, and I can tell you the rest of the story. We seem to think that temptation is exterior. Temptation is out there. But when we look at James, who is the brother of Jesus Christ, James says that temptation starts between the ears. The temptation started long before he ran into an old friend. Temptation started with his thinking that never got changed. He was living in stinking thinking. And he never had his mind transformed to think healthy. And so <coughs> when 
he was presented with a situation, he had already primed his mind and his thinking to go south before it ever came up. Uh, temptation, there's kind of four ways that it works. Number one is desire. He always had the desire to be taking the drugs. It was the predominant force in his life. And uh, uh, we have natural desires, but we also have desires that can be uh, destructive. And so James is saying we're tempted when we're led by our desires. Second of all, temptation uh, happens. The second step is our desire. I want it. And uh, <laughs> in his case, uh, one drink was, won't hurt. <clears throat> and then after that, a thousand's not enough. And so the lie that he would believe was, I can control it, and I doubt that it's really that bad. And so you, you justify in your mind, uh, I don't think it's really that bad. You begin to doubt the destruction. You look back over your life, and it's a total uh, wake of broken things. But you begin to doubt that you're the cause. <laughs> Although you're the common factor... Everybody else is the cause, and you don't. And then you move to the third stage, which is deception. I know I'm not the cause. I know I can handle this. And so deception is the third stage. I got it. <clears throat> I can control it. Uh, you remember <coughs> in the uh, Garden of Eden, Satan says, you know, uh, God doesn't want you to eat that fruit because he doesn't want you to be as wise as him. Now, if you eat that, you'll be as wise as God. You'll know good and evil. The desire he planted there. And then he works on the doubt. Did God really say? I'm not sure that it was true. And then deception, which is, yeah, you know, Satan's probably right. I won't die. And so the fourth stage of that is disobedience and defeat. And that's the way that it happens. And it all happens between your ears. All right. <laughs> the disobedience and defeat comes after the thought, it's just harmless thinking. It can't bother me. It's just a fantasy. I'm just playing with it. There are no harmless fantasies. They are shaping your life. They're shaping your life. Why? Your brain is designed by God to be a creative force, and it will bring about. When you go to a, <clears throat> when you go to a uh, what do they call it, like a multi-level marketing, what do they do? They want you to think a certain way. <laughs> they would say, now think about uh, these motorhomes. Think about this boat. Think about all of the good things in life. Think about the wealth that you can generate. Why do they take that board and get you to have a dream board? So that you will bring it about. They figured out how God created you. And they want you to use it to bring about wealth with their product line. <laughs> Why? Because you are created in the image of God, and you can create what you focus on. Say amen. You will create what you focus on. Your thoughts shape your life. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you're focusing on what God wants you to focus on, because you will bring that about. That's how he created you. And that's why he says, be careful what you think. It shapes your life. Now... Uh, what do we think about? You have to focus something. Like women especially have to think. Guys, we, not so much. No. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Nothing. <laughs> and what is he really thinking about? Nothing. <clears throat> In that, uh, they did that uh, enhanced MRI, uh, functional fMRI. fMRI. And uh, a guy's brain at rest has very little activity. It's got one little electrical spike. Boop. It's about every time his heart beats. Boop. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> That's all that's going on. <laughs> really, there's nothing going on. Boop. <laughs> what are you thinking about? Nothing. Boop. <laughs> but for you people who have to think, <clears throat> what do you think about? <laughs> what do you think about? How do you control the, the direction of your mind so it doesn't control you? Number one, uh, the owner's manual says that if you think about Jesus Christ, that gives you a focus. Hebrews says, think about Jesus' example. He held on. While wicked people were doing evil things to him, he didn't get tired and he didn't stop trying. What's he saying? It doesn't matter how difficult your life gets. Don't quit. Look at what Jesus Christ did. Focus on him. Follow his life. Follow him. Jesus' invitation was not complicated. He just said, follow me. So this is a continue. Just follow and think about what Jesus did. 
Secondly, think about others. I need to tell you this. Some people who don't consider others, who won't serve others, who won't help others, who are blind to others' needs, will always be emotionally unhealthy and will eventually get physically unhealthy. Now, how did the guy who wrote this thing know that? Oh, he created us. That's right. I forgot. Okay. So, if you don't think about others, you will never be healthy. Uh, uh, <clears throat> if you are uh, only about yourself, Philippians says, don't just, Paul, again, writing to the church at Philippi, says, don't just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others, too, and be interested in what they are doing. Hebrews says, let us think about each other and help each other to show love and to do good deeds. So, first of all, think about Jesus Christ, and if you're going to have any level of emotional health, you have to consider others. Uh, and the third thing is to think about eternity. I would say this is one area where we just don't consider it at all. I think one of the things we're struggling with in our country is all of our decisions are made on the profit line of the next quarter, and sometimes we'll sacrifice five-year health to get a good report in three months. Do you know what I'm saying? Short-term profit, short-term gains, and not paying the price for long-term stability. Well, you and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, have to always keep in our thinking the eternal aspects of the equation. We're going to spend a lot more time on that line, on the other side of the line, than we are this side. <laughs> we have to always have consideration about the other side of the equation. Uh, when Paul was writing to the church at Colossae, he says, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. And uh, in the King James Version, we use this at funerals. <laughs> A little late for that person, but maybe we can gain wisdom. Set your minds on things above, not on things on earth. Let heaven fill your thoughts. You heard the saying... Some people are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. I don't believe that. I think only people who are heavenly minded can do anything that's earthly good. I think people are so earthly minded they're no heavenly good. Does that make sense? They won't keep into the equation of their life the consequences for eternity. And so we as healthy followers of Jesus Christ have to keep our mind on eternity. Why? Because no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. So, how you think is shaping your life. If you review your thought life, that's the influencer of your life. Your thought life is shaping your living life. And the scripture says, as it teaches us, be careful how you think. It shapes your life. And then Paul expands upon it and he says, don't be transformed, don't be squeezed into the mold of this thinking, but be transformed. Free up your mind. Feed it truth every day. Feed your mind and focus your mind. And that is how we take control of our thought life. Your thought life has no business shaping your mind. Your thought life should be on Jesus Christ who will transform your mind. Amen? Would you stand with me? <clears throat> Remember, you are valuable and loved by God. And there is someone competing for your thought life who doesn't love God and doesn't love you. And you'll feel that struggle going on. But Paul says, listen, guys, don't be squeezed into that way of thinking. Be transformed and set free by the life of Christ who's in you. Let that be the driving force of your life. So this week, as we have our quiet time, our devotions, hang on to that truth all through the day until it changes the way you think into the way Jesus thinks. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, your intentions for us are better than we could even imagine. Your ability to bring about your intentions in our life 
is secure. We have seen how you created everything around us, and you had the power to bring it about, to create a place where we can live, and you certainly have the power that you placed in us to overcome every temptation, to transform our thinking, and to transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, so that we can experience the life here that you promised to us, a wonderful life. So, Lord, we grasp onto your truth. We focus on our Savior, Jesus. And, Lord, we will feed our minds your holy word every day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a few minutes and uh, uh, have communion now. You've heard it called Eucharist. Eucharist means thanksgiving. We are so thankful for what God has done in our life. Now, you're not... Uh, uh, this is not a Cape Coral Community Church thing, uh, although God loves us and thinks we're special, probably one of the better churches in Cape Coral. Really, <clears throat> this is for every believer in Jesus Christ around the world. And he said, do this and remember me. Remember what I did for you. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you come and have communion with your Lord. Here, you don't have to just... Uh, have communion. We just take a, a piece of uh, flat bread. We dip it in the grape juice. And this reminds us uh, that Christ sacrificed his body and uh, gave us his life so that we could be free. So that this thing that we preached this morning, you can have dominance over your thinking and your thinking doesn't have to have dominance over you. The power of this act and rising from the dead again is where the power comes from for you to live the victorious life. So come, don't rush back to your seats if you don't want to. Stay for a few minutes and talk to God. This may be the quietest, richest, holy moment you're going to have this week. Just linger, talk to God, and commune with him. And say, Lord, I am struggling with my thought life, but you promised the power to overcome. Amen? You promised me the power to overcome. Just have a conversation with God and let him fill you this morning. Our Heavenly Father, these are the symbols you ask us to remember where that power came from. You and your ability to predict your own death and then rise from the dead again just the way you predicted. We put all of our faith in you. We believe all of your promises and now this morning allow us to receive them in Jesus' name. Amen. the bread of life you are the bread of life he who comes to me will never go hungry and he who believes in me will never be thirsty you are Remember me. 
I hope that you experience God and his love this morning. And how do you fulfill his promise of transforming your thinking? That verse that don't be transformed, but don't be conformed, but be transformed, that's really my life verse, but I want to tell you, this is a verse. When you find yourself thinking unhealthy thoughts, you need to change the channel. What channel? do you select to think about? Well, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. When your mind goes into tr conformed thinking, take it into transformation. Amen? Amen? Think about those things. And then it says, the God of peace will guard your hearts. You think about his thoughts, his spirit will guard your hearts. Let's, how many of us have been blessed by the Lord? Yeah? Okay. Good deal. God is good. All the time. All, the time. God is good. All right, let's tell him. Praise you, God. Oh, first, I think maybe we'll have a special and take up the offering. <laughs> Before we thank God for the offering. <laughs> Just checking to see if they're paying attention. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else. I need you, oh how I need you, oh how I need you, oh how I need you.
Thank you, guys. Yeah, it's not every church in Cape Coral can say they had a visit from Barry Hawley, is it? <laughs> Let's just celebrate God. Praise you, God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this place where we can gather, learn more about you, and feel more in touch with you, God. Let the feebleness of our minds and the inability to control it remind us of how much we need you this week, mm. how much we need your word mm -hmm. to conform our mind to your spirit and your mm -hmm. likeness. Mm -hmm. Lord, give us that reminder this week and give us the power to overcome our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Walk this week in the victory of Jesus Christ. Amen.